My name's Duncan Green. I'm uh, head of research at Oxfam. Um, it's great to be here. It's great to be at Christian Aid. I'm stricken with envy at the food stalls outside. If you leave Oxfam, you get a ring road. And if you leave Christian Aid, you get some fantastic cuisine. So I'm definitely going to try and jump ship. Um, okay, I'm going to kick this off briefly. A few thank yous. Thank you, obviously, to Christian Aid. We have plotted the downfall of capitalism many times in these basements, and it's always good to come back. Um, Thanks to DFID and the Government and Transparency Fund, uh, fund which has supported a, 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 the work we're going to hear about and a lot of other people's work, um, and also has given us a hashtag for those tweeters amongst you. So please hashtag GTF series. Okay, GTF for Governance and Transparency Fund, I just worked out. Um, but apart from that, your phones are, will of course be on silent, so that you can tweet while not annoying people. Yes? Good. All right, we've got one change of the uh, speakers. Um, Marilyn Thompson has kindly stepped in from the Central American Women's Network as the discussant, Hello. which is always the best job, because you don't have to do any preparation and you get to uh, slag off everybody else. So that's, that's <laughs> not great. Say what you want. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, and in return for chairing this, I get to bang on for five minutes, I'm told. So uh, I just want to make a couple of uh, uh, comments. First, um, stress some of the progress, some of the good news. You know, I was looking at the numbers for um, women parliamentarians in Latin America up to 25%. Yes, it's not 50%, but it's much better than it was. Um, formation of UN women, the idea of having the flagship World Bank report on, on, women, uh, on gender inequality 10 years ago would have been unthinkable, um, and yet that's what the, the topic was last year. So you, some real progress, I think, which we should recognize rather than feel grumpy about. Um, but a lot of the progress has been on women for development. So, yeah, hey, if you invest in women, you get lots of other things. You get, you know, uh, you get falling family size, you get uh, better education statistics, you get more workers. Um, the bit about development for women, rather than women for development, much less clear. If you just look at the absence of debates on the care economy and all the discussion around the financial crisis, um, the, the difficulty in getting gender-based violence onto agendas other than the gender-based violence agenda, just a number of areas where it, the debate is very constrained. Um, the topic comes up a lot for us at the moment because we're doing a lot of thinking in Oxfam on theories of change and power analysis and trying to work out what kinds of power analysis fit a gendered lens or a gendered view. And, and there seem to be two particular frames which, which Joe may well be talking about later, which is one is this sense of power within. At what point do... do do women acquire a sense of uh, rights and outrage and um, uh, agency and, uh, and then what do they do with it? But the other one, I think, is invisible power. The, the, uh, who has the power to set the agenda? Who has the power to make certain subjects the subjects of discussion and other subjects somehow never get on the table back to the care economy again? Um, and what we're finding as we try and address some of these power imbalances is just how deeply rooted they are. So looking at you know, some of the work we're doing on domestic on violence against women in, in South Asia, some really interesting stuff on governance and accountability. It's just an extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily resilient form of disempowerment which we're facing here. Um, final point, gender doesn't mean women. Gender means people like me too. Um, uh, some of the interesting stuff we've uh, found, for example, when we, when we did a big project on, on, on uh, violence against women uh, in South Asia and, and asked people to sign up as change makers, uh, I think the numbers now, four million people have signed up to be change makers, talk to their neighbours and friends about uh, violence against women, and half of them are men, which was not in the plan at all. And it's really interesting finding out from the men why they did it. You know, it's not just because they get a nice little package of posters. There are other sort of more uh, laudable motives behind it. Um, some really interesting stuff there. And we're also doing some really interesting work on constructions of masculinity in the Middle East, where you're actually finding out <laughs> the, the very complex relationships between men and their mothers and how this seems to recreate certain ideas about the roles of women. And just uh, it makes you think about the points of intervention in quite a different way. Okay, that's my five minutes. Um, we're going to go to who's first? Jethro, Jethro Pettit is going to speak first for 15 minutes. Um, Jethro is uh, from the Institute of Development Studies, from which all knowledge springs. Um, uh, <laughs> Terrifying thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he's a research fellow uh, from the Participation, Power and Social Change team, and he's going to speak for 15 minutes. Thank you, Duncan, and thanks also to uh, 
to Joe and Emily for inviting me today. Um, yesterday at IDS, uh, there was a takeover, a sort of an Occupy um, event in which the entire institute was taken over by the MA students in gender and development. Uh, quite by surprise, as takeovers and Occupy events need to be. And they called it Gender Takeover Day. <clears throat> and it began with an email sent to everyone saying uh, why it was that they were doing this. And part of that email I just wanted to read. It says, um, we believe that gender is underrepresented at IDS and should be made more visible. And our intention is to bring it back into view today. Gender is not only about feelings and relationships, and it is certainly not only a soft women's issue. Gender is a body of theory that has developed over the past decades, and it is not only about women. Gender is a topic that affects all of us, both those who identify as feminists and those who don't, those who identify as women, men, trans, or something different. We invite you to explore gender and how it applies to all our lives and how it intersects with what we do as development practitioners. And then what they did is they, um, they organized a whole series of very sort of creative cultural um, opportunities for people to explore what gender means <coughs> in relation to their, uh, in relation to people's particular interests and, and so forth. Welcome. Yeah. 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 Pause a moment. If people can sort of get to the back without knocking out of the camera, that'd be great. <laughs> no problem. Good to see a packed house. <laughs> So I think the, the points that they made in the email are important, that, that gender is a significant body of theory that's developed over many decades, that it applies to men and women and people who identify in other ways in terms of their gender, that it relates to all issues, not just to women's issues or, or even what we might think of as gender issues, that, it, that it, uh, it arises in almost every sphere of development, governance, politics, and representation that you can think of which is the sort of focus of today. But I think it was also really significant and interesting that they chose to raise this agenda and to say these things through direct cultural action uh, in an institutional sphere, uh, rather than through electing a representative to serve on a committee um, to express these views in some sort of a formal setting. Now, in saying that, I don't want to disparage the importance of representation of gender issues and of women in formal political processes, because that's vital and a lot of research shows that it's enormously, can be enormously impactful. But I think it does speak to uh, a theme that I think we'll, we will be exploring today in terms of gender and governance, which is, um, is this enough? Is it enough to ensure representation? Is it enough to have quotas and affirmative action? Is it enough to uh, ensure that women are in positions of um, uh, having political voice in formal political spaces? Um, or what more might be needed um, to ensure that their issues are, are heard, addressed, and responded to? Um, and, um, and I think it's an important question to ask because so much of the uh, of the emphasis has been on quotas and representation um, and uh, you know for some good reasons when you look at the composition of legislatures and and so on um, but in just measuring the numbers uh, there are a number of risks that um, that uh, we can miss what what uh, changes in gender relations and governance and what changes in power and what effectiveness of voice really means um, in politics um, when it comes to uh, women's voices and, and gender issues coming into the political sphere. So I guess I would just end this little introductory, introductory bit by saying that um, I think representation and quotas and affirmative action are very important, but that they're only part of the picture, um, and that getting women to formal political spaces is not enough to make um, governance gender aware, that a lot more is needed. And what I'd like to do is, is to share a few key points that have come out of recent IDS research, um, particularly the um, Pathways of Women's Empowerment Research Consortium, um, which has been working in many countries with uh, more than 60 feminist researchers around the world um, on a whole range of issues, but broadly categorized into, work, into research on women's work and economic livelihoods. Um, women's voice and political representation, 
and women's bodies and uh, sort of sexual and reproductive rights issues um, and uh, sexuality issues. So that's one sphere that I wanted to draw on briefly. And the other is the work of, um, well, more broadly speaking, of, um, of feminist researchers and activists. Um, in particular, I just wanted to refer to the work of Just Associates, um, who many of you may know, uh, which is a, a network of activist practitioners working around the world in many countries on issues of women's, uh, women's power and empowerment, and, but also, importantly, bringing feminist and gender issues into movement building more broadly. And it's very interesting, if you read their work carefully, they, they talk about um, feminist movement building, not building feminist movements, or actually both, but they, they each have a different meaning. Um, and then thirdly, uh, <clears throat> what I'd like to share draws on work that uh, myself and colleagues and people like Joe Rowlands and others in NGOs have been doing, which uh, Duncan referred to, which is uh, exploring concepts of power and empowerment and what they mean for uh, making development uh, s support and interventions and accompaniment more meaningful and effective. And that work has involved um, testing out of, um, of, of sort of concepts and frameworks, including the ones that Duncan mentioned. It's involved a lot of um, participatory research and action learning, carrying out learning activities with people who are on the ground working on these issues and exploring their own realities and case studies in relationship to these concepts, interrogating the concepts with their experience as well as the other way around. And I think a lot has been learned, um, as Duncan mentioned, about you know, which of these frameworks are effective and how they can be applied. So I wanted to begin by saying a few things to add to what was said already about uh, which of these concepts we found to be valuable. And um, briefly, this draws on a range of sort of social theory, feminist theory, political science, um, a whole range of different kinds of ways of understanding power, which don't add up to any one unified theory but which can be very complementary. And I think the first thing that I would say that we've learned is that a multidimensional approach to power that tries to look at all of these things together um, <clears throat> um, is more effective than just taking one lens and one, one angle. And so briefly, what would those lenses be? Duncan mentioned one, which is this framework that looks at um, the differences between sort of visible, hidden, and invisible power. And without going into great depth, uh, at one end, you have the kind of visible power of actors who dominate and control each other, um, whether visibly or behind the scenes, um, sort of blocking agendas and uh, being gatekeepers and so on. On the other end of the spectrum, you have the invisible power of socialized norms, so socio-cultural norms that, are, that, are, that pervade society and that are internalized. Um, and these uh, can be the most insidious because they're the ones that shape what it is that we say we want, how we express ourselves, um, even when we do have a voice. Um, and there's a lot of theory that goes into explaining very, very strong research and theory that goes into explaining different way, in different ways how this socialized, internalized power works, from postmodernism to feminist theory and uh, many other sources. Um, and then the third framework that I think we found really useful is the one that uh, Duncan also mentioned. Uh, he spoke about power within, um, but in the work that Joe has done in Central America and others, um, power is often defined as something that's about domination and control. Um, and yet, uh, you can't really do anything without power, and power can also be a positive force for change. And the, the different forms that positive power can take, um, uh, in addition to the one that was mentioned, which is the power within of dignity and self-esteem and kind of self-awareness, um, is the collective power of people coming together, pooling that self-awareness into action um, and into shared knowledge, and also the power, too, of individual agency. And these positive forms of power, or expressions of power, as they're sometimes called, or vital forms of power, there are different names for them, have been enormously useful to people working on the front lines of bringing about social change and, um, and empowerment work. And uh, they've been kind of empowering concepts of power rather than just thinking of it in the negative. The last one that I'd mention is the concept of spaces, 
and there are different ways of thinking about spaces. Um, in, in some of our work on power, we talk about sort of um, uh, formal closed spaces, um, invited spaces of consultation, um, and uh, claimed spaces uh, created by social movements and civil society actors. And one of the interesting things when you begin to look at these spaces that, is that spaces themselves are characterized by power. So uh, they have their own boundaries of norms, language, behavior, like the space that we're in now, certain ways that you can express yourself, other ways that you can't. And unless you're sort of aware of what those power constraints are in the spaces, um, you're not necessarily going to be able to um, change the way that people can have a voice within those spaces. So gaining voice and representation in politics is not just about being present and being able to speak. It's about uh, cha recognizing and challenging the boundaries and norms of that space and transforming them in a way so that different kinds of voices can be heard. And this is extremely important in spaces that are dominated by particular sort of traditional male patriarchal forms of discourse and expression and which mar marginalize or exclude ways of speaking that are considered to be women's ways of knowing or speaking um, and that are often disparaged. And that, that's a cultural shift that has to take place for uh, women's voices in representative spaces to be effective. Um, it isn't just about being there. And there's a lot of research that points to the difference between sort of presence or access, which is what a lot of quotas and representation are about, and influence, and actually having a voice and having that voice be heard. So that's a really important one. And um, I would just, uh, the, I think the last thing I would say about this is that we found that um, coming back to this point that all of these frameworks of power that we've been talking about um, are, are really in a sense necessary to be able to um, address the issue of representation, voice, and influence of women and of gender issues in politics. Um, Joe and I did a really interesting piece of work a few years ago where we took a sort of broad look at about more than 1,200, where we had a lot of help from some students, more than 1,200 um, Oxfam projects that are to do with governance and the right to be heard. And we located these projects on a spectrum of those that dealt with the more visible actors, processes, and mechanisms of politics, and those, on the other hand, which dealt with the underlying sociocultural, invisible, pervasive power. And we found that most of them actually were more on the side of the visible and of the kind of formal mechanisms of representation and voice. And that we, we found that actually a lot more could be done in the sphere of awareness raising, popular education, organizing, what is sometimes called preparation for voice. All the things that have to happen before you enter a formal space or in order to be heard once you're in that space and in order for your voice to actually carry um, influence and power in that space. And, um, and that, I think, is where I would end, is with just a few quick thoughts about kind of policy lessons or directions. Um, um, I'd hope to say a little bit more about the limitations of some of the sort of focusing only on the formal, but I think that's very plain in, in the research, those the sort of strengths and limitations of only focusing on formal representation and quotas. I think I would end with just saying that there's a need for um, uh, to move away from mechanisms that only focus on these formal kinds of representation um, and that measure them through quotas and numbers and so on. Um, and that look at the ways that you could build women's empowerment, engagement, and so on in non-formal institutions um, of public deliberation, um, political parties, civil society groups, social movements, women's movements, um, the media, the cultural sphere, all the things that we saw yesterday going on in IDS to raise awareness and to, to, to sort of shift the cultural boundaries around these issues. Uh, so that when a representative of the student body comes onto a committee to address uh, the role of gender in IDS teaching, there is a, there is a receptivity and space for that voice to be heard uh, because there's been a deliberative process to shape it and give it power and uh, because there's been a normative shift in the ability to listen to those issues and to incorporate them into the institution. And so I think they go, hand, they go sort of hand in glove, uh, but unfortunately I think that these uh, broader activities in the, in the sphere of empowerment, collective action, 
awareness raising, popular education, mobilizing, cultural work, and so on. Um, is, is, it's harder to measure and it's harder to kind of um, quantify, and therefore I think less attention gets given to it, and there's m and there's less and less funding available for for work in that sphere, and I think to the detriment of efforts to strengthen women's power and voice in governance and politics. So maybe I'll Thanks. end there. Thanks, yeah. And what do people Google if they want to find your work? Well, they could look at uh, Pathways of Women's Empowerment. Um, okay. That would be the portal that would take you to a lot of the research that I've uh, drawn on today. Uh, I would also draw your attention to a recent, to their uh, five-year synthesis report, which came out in January, which is a brilliant summary of a lot of the things that, uh, and, and a lot more that I've been talking about. Um, in particular, there is an IDS bulletin by, um, edited by Maurice Tadros about quotas with a number of case studies from around the world, which came out in 2010. And there's some really excellent findings there about the strengths and weaknesses of quotas and representation and affirmative action. Great. So. Thanks, Sophia. Uh, wonderfully self-disciplined on the time. Brilliant. Um, I think we're going to have a short video here, because um, not least because the panel is rather white and northern. Um, and we wanted to have at least some voices from the south in the room. This is a short video from Nepal, from some of the work of the uh, uh, self-explanatory. Okay. Uh, next speaker is Joe Rowlands, who is a senior governance advisor at Oxfam um, and uh, is program manager for the Raising Her Voice uh, program, which she can explain, I think. Joe, you all set up? Yeah. Can we have some lights back on? That's what, what I was it? asking for. Uh, if anybody wondered why the care economy is coming up the agenda that last uh, 
comment uh, from our Nepali friend, um, I think, probably illustrates it very well. Um, great to be here, and um, I'm rather daunted by the task I have, which is really to kind of describe to you a bit the work that we've been doing at Oxfam uh, with the funding from the Governance and Transparency Fund, which um, is a big program of work, and I've got 15 minutes, so I'm going to give you some tantalising, well, I hope tantalising snippets. Um, we chose to focus the program on the, on the, the conjunction of, of gender and governance, and it, it's a global program of work promoting the rights and, and capacity of poor women to participate and engage in governance at, at all levels. Very much about women making their voices heard, increasing their influence and making institutions more accountable. So great, we have a map. Um, 17 countries across the world with 45 partner organisations on the ground and working with a number of networks and coalitions, so a total of about 410 coalition members. It's been a very diverse portfolio. The, each of the projects has been very context specific in terms of what hooks have been used to, uh, what the entry points have been um, into the subject. And we've, we've been supporting issues around legal reform, around voter registration, um, a whole lot around human rights frameworks, and particularly in Africa, supporting the process around the uh, Africa Women's Protocol, the Maputo Protocol. Um, budget monitoring, budget uh, social auditing work, lots of uh, things around the intersections between um, things like uh, domestic violence and governance, uh, HIV and AIDS and governance, uh, disability and governance and so on. So there's been a really mixed bag of work uh, and some fascinating, as you've already seen, stories coming through. I think Perhaps one of the things to say is that what we've been noticing in terms of what impact is coming from the investment that's been made and all the effort that's been put in has been, there have been kind of two different kinds of impact. So there's been an impact that's quite big and dramatic. So we have the example of Uganda where we've seen some, some big new legal <coughs> stuff in place. So we have new laws, um, we have a new domestic violence law, we have anti-trafficking of persons laws, we have anti-female genital mutilation laws in Uganda, and that's just 2010. We don't claim that our program did all of that work by any manner of means, but we're confident we made a significant contribution to that, and it's going to bring big, big change for a lot of women in Uganda. So that's the kind of big dramatic stuff. And then there's the, the small-scale step-by-step -step incremental change that I think the Nepal example illustrates of what happens when you work with people over a period of time on some of the little things that look on their own little or insignificant but together add up to big change and I'll come back to the Nepal one. Um, okay, so gender, I mean I th we started off with a big assumption that it really mattered to bring together the issues of gender and governance and I think um, the whole kind of critical importance of women becoming active participants uh, and leaders in, in governance, both in the processes and within the structures of governance, not just because of gender equality, but because of the whole, you know, using the DFID framework, the whole um, capability, accountability and responsiveness kind of agenda. And of course, for any meaningful work to reduce poverty, that, that this is absolutely central. But what has become very clear, and this won't be news probably to those of you that have been working in this field for a while, but the whole issue of the quality of the work really matters. And, and as we've already heard, the, the numbers, you know, going for numbers isn't what actually brings the big changes. Numbers are part of the picture, but they're not the only part that we need to pay attention to. So I think what we've seen in our programme is that where women's participation in decision making is truly meaningful, you see a lot happening. And uh, I'll tell you a bit more about Nepal and various other ones as well. But that it takes really deliberate strategies, like to get good quality programme isn't, isn't something that will happen by accident. We need to think about it and plan for it and resource it properly and build it in. And, and that goes just as much for the standalone work as for the, the mainstreamed work. So. I want to talk just a bit about what meaningful participation means. I think that's the kind of main uh, thing that we get excited about in, in our work. So 
getting women into the right spaces, and uh, Jethro talked a bit about the spaces, and getting them in with the right skills, with the, with the skills, with the knowledge, um, with the confidence, to be able to engage effectively in those spaces. So um, I'll talk a bit more about Nepal there, because uh, we're really excited about this work. We, we supported, in three districts of Nepal, we, dis we supported work in, um, in the end, 81 different, uh, they set up a set series of community discussion classes, 81 different classes. Um, and we supported the, the training of facilitators and so on, using um, the REFLECT methodology from, from ActionAid as our starting point. Um, the classes met on a daily basis. Now, we never planned to have these things happening on a daily basis, but the women wanted it. Um, they wanted to be on the case of this work, um, absolutely on a daily basis in their lives. And you can see some of the results that came out of that from, from the video clip. Um, so they covered all sorts of subjects in the classes over, over the period of time they were running, but they chose to focus particularly on four community-level kind of governance structures. So um, committees and user groups on forestry, on health, on sanitation, and on education. They decided together that that would be where the effort would go. So the one we just heard about was an education example. Um, we had 2,000 of the numbers still leave me a bit speechless actually that we had 2,004 participants in these classes and of those 1,472 have moved into positions of active participation and leadership in their various communities and 154 in key positions sort of you know chair people and treasurers and so on so I think tremendous you know if you really invest in the minute process the, the big effect that can come out of that uh, it was a huge increase during the project period, so we went from a baseline figure of 28% female participation in these kinds of structures to 48%, so nearly half now in those communities uh, of, the, of the membership is female. And very clear distinction with some control group communities that we, we looked at, so um, in terms of the difference that was made. I could talk about Nepal for a long time, but I, I have to move on. Uh, so meaningful participation and another element that we've been looking at is, is the quality of analysis and the, um, the access, access to power and ability to manoeuvre around the sort of structures of governance, both within government and within other kinds of institutions and, and supporting people to, to understand better how those kinds of things work and how they can engage. So an example from South Africa, I'm going to start skating through examples at this point, Example from South Africa with our partner Power, people opposed to women abuse, um, who uh, organised community dialogues during a municipal election process with potential councillors, with the candidates in the election process. Um, lots of different ways of getting women's demands into the, the, the line of <coughs> sight of people standing for election and increasingly then negotiating around those. And there's a really nice example out of that process of a councillor who actually signed a five-year contract with the women in the community that he was representing about what he was going to work on during his period in office, which I think is a really interesting model. I'll take you to Honduras now. So our programme was starting up fairly soon after the, or, or even during the, the, the coup, um, and, and very chaotic politics at the time. We've been working at both national level and municipal level in Honduras. So at national level, working with Visitación Parilla to, to strengthen a network of, of women and to, to get the alliances kind of pulling together uh, in a rather chaotic context to, to, to support electoral reform. And uh, very recently now, um, we have a 50% quota uh, approved by Congress in the form of the, um, the, the political organizations law that, that's recently been approved. So with all the caveats of the, of the quotas, but nonetheless uh, a useful step. And two of the more recently formed political parties have also instituted 50% quotas into their own statutes. So that's been a very cross-party engagement and, and quite interesting results. I could talk quite a bit about what's happening also at municipal level, but I think I probably need to move on to Pakistan. Uh, just to give you a different piece, so again, on the agenda of what, what does it mean to be effective and to have good quality work, 
one of the pieces that's been coming through raising her voice quite a lot is this issue of, well, it's one version of a missing middle. So a lot of focus, increasing focus, <coughs> going on local level change, which is often in governance where uh, the NGO sector can have the biggest impact, and a fair amount at national level, particularly through campaigning and advocacy work, but very little joining the two and addressing the middle level. So in Pakistan, amongst other things, we've, we've been supporting a series of 50 women leaders groups that's bringing together women who'd been elected at, at local council level. We won't go into the electoral collapse in, in Pakistan, but they continue to, uh, to meet. One and a half thousand women councillors, or at that point ex-councillors, um, from a whole range of backgrounds, um, getting them connected and getting them feeding each other's energy and efforts in really interesting ways, looking for solutions to local pro problems. Very connected into local level activism, uh, but also able to then pressure to the national level. So just to give you a couple of examples, um, we have one example of a woman who filed a court stay order. Um, the local Zakat committee, the Islamic Relief Funds committee, was a, had been created totally undemocratically um, a group of men leading it and she filed this this thing to, to get 15% representation of women on that committee which they've now achieved that's one example another leader took a case to the high court uh, to challenge some of the some of the labor moves at government level ag against uh, workers being able to organize on on some pretty terrible labor conditions um, and they managed to make a big change to a, a, a number of factories Coca-Cola, perhaps I shouldn't mention it. <laughs> Too late, <laughs> slipped out. <laughs> um, okay, so again, I could talk a lot about really fascinating stuff in Pakistan. That, um, you know, thousands and thousands more women have the vote in Pakistan because of this program of work. I mean, really exciting. Okay, so so that was three different aspects of the quality issue. What, what, we, th what we tried to do when we were halfway through the program at the point of midterm review was reflect on what is this telling us about changes. We hadn't started off with a clear theory of change. It was kind of implicit, really, in the thinking. So we tried to make it explicit. And um, mm, it's not hugely legible, but never mind. You can look at it in more detail. We, we can circulate it if people want it. Um, we basically wanting a theory of change and it, it's very much embedded in, in the range of programs that we're working on that, that we're looking at a very complex uh, set of things that need to happen for women to actually be active participants in effective ways in a range of governance structures. You can't just look at political participation, you can't just put your effort into the quotas thing, you know, getting women officially into those positions. You have to look at a bigger picture. And so we've, we've kind of got this model that is looking at the personal level. We, we've heard about the, you know, all the work around tackling those invisible power things, you know, and, and how you grow power within. How do you get people confident to go out into the world and s with the, the, the knowledge they need to do that in a way that, that actually will make a difference? And also what, we, what we've called the social sphere, which is really around organising the power with, that Jethro mentioned, activism, um, getting people into c collections of people so that their voice can, can be magnified. And we've, we've certainly got a lot of that kind of activity. I, I thought I'd just mention the, our, our Gambia programme, actually, because um, there you've got a very high-level political sphere, African Women's Protocol, which had just been ratified uh, but wasn't yet in domestic law when we started our project and, and got enacted into the Women Act uh, in 2010. And then using that social sphere of, of, of networking and, and collective action, really pushing for implementation of that new legislation. Um, lots, and, and one of the things they did was take a couple of very ordinary kind of everyday legal cases and make a relationship with media such that those legal cases would get a huge amount of coverage mm -hmm. and thereby raise a lot of awareness across the country about what, what is now possible under the new legislation. So that's been really interesting. Um, and in, in, uh, in Gambia also, you know, the personal sphere work that, that needed to be done as well. Yeah, okay. Um, I've only got two minutes and luckily I'm nearly at the end, so that's a great relief. <laughs> 
So reflecting on the lessons of all this, and I'm sorry it's been such a whirlwind tour because we could have done a 10 hour version and still have plenty to talk about. But the, the kind of, I think one of the key messages to other people and a, a lot of you, this, this isn't new, this is a kind of in a way giving us evidence to say something that a lot of us know anyway at, at a sort of more intuitive level perhaps, that we are dealing with complexity, we are dealing with power relations and it really does matter in terms of achieving um, gender equitable governance to pay attention to things that a lot of people would say, what's that got to do with governance? The violence that stops people going out of the home, you know, the, the, all, all of the, the different things like that, that, that are very personal, um, but really affect one's ability to, to be an active participant in, in anything. Uh, so working on the different aspects really matters. and. Um, even if it doesn't look like the topic you think you're you're working on. So that's one thing. Um, and I think we need to continue to work in a way that focuses very deliberately on these issues in a standalone sort of a way, at the same time as continuing to try and build this into everything we do. It's That's an argument we've had for a long time, but we're very confident with this wide, diverse programme of work that we have to continue to, to do both of those things. Um, the meaningful piece, absolutely, you know, tokenism won't work, tick boxes won't work, uh, quotas on their own won't work, though they're part of the mix. It, it really matters to pay attention to, to the detail of, of how these kinds of changes happen and, and to budget for that work, not just to kind of put it into our documents, but to actually put it into our um, outcomes uh, and, and our intended impact as well. And then the final message is a bit of a surprise to me in a way, uh, is a kind of message that says this doesn't actually have to cost a huge amount of money. Because I think what we've learned through, through the way we've gone about it, we, we, I mean the GTF money looked quite substantial but as soon as you start thinking about a programme in 17 countries, actually it's peanuts per, per country, that we, you know, you can achieve a remarkable amount if you think carefully enough about where you put that resource and, and what we've been able to do is kind of magnify you know, the money by working very strongly with coalitions, with women's organisations and women's networks who are able to then uh, amplify and, and, and duplicate and, and so on. So our bit of money kind of goes into a pool but the ripples are actually quite noticeable. You can really see that you can spread further. Um, it does matter to have the budget, but it hasn't got to break the bank. So the Gambia programme was £50,000 a year. The Pakistan programme, which was a much bigger programme, was 150000 a year. I mean, not massive amounts in, in development terms. But the leverage that's been achieved has been enormous. And a lot of that is because the way we've prioritised working and the people we've chosen to work with are people who are passionate about making these changes happen. So the multiplier effect isn't just about you know, the money going out through networks and the ideas spreading, but is also around um, helping people connect up energy and helping people um, bring that passion to bear in a way that can really make change happen. So I'll mm. stop there. Passion is value for money. This is obviously a message, <laughs> a message for different there. Right there. Um, OK, excellent. Thanks, Joe. Um, Marilyn. Uh, Marilyn mm. is from the Central American Women's Network and has been for a substantial time. Yes. We worked together <laughs> too long ago. Um, anyway, take it away, Marilyn. Okay. Um, well, I've, I've been asked to reflect um, on what has been said by the speakers, but also to um, say something about some work that Corn has been engaged in in Honduras at the grassroots level. Um, so, um, really, just to reflect on what Jeff. Jethro sort of raised, the, what struck me was the whole issue of power relations and the different forms of power and empowerment. And I, in my day job, I do a lot of training on gender, and I always think that that exercise on the different forms of power is one that people really grasp onto. And last year in July, I did a two-day advocacy training in Bolivia with sort of activists and one of the exercises was that identifying different types of power and people really caught on to that and I think um, you know you know 
you've got to address all those different levels if you're going to be effective. Mm -hmm. And um, Joe's also mentioned that, you know, like you've got to have quotas, you've got to have, you know, people aware and engaged at a local level, people have got to feel that self-empowerment and, um, you know, and they've got to have solidarity and collective power to make changes. So I think that really came up and I've seen that report by the um, Pathways to Empowerment, it's very impressive. And, I think to have the theoretical engagement and then the sort of practical on the ground activi activism is, you know, really important. And, um, you know, the whole, you mentioned the Jazz Associates and movement building. I think also to have some sort of global action is really important. And it's not just, you know, women you know, doing their thing in Pakistan and Nepal, but that's part of a bigger picture. And, um, you know, in 1995, we had the Beijing conference, and the, you know, <laughs> um, you know, what's happened to that huge movement to make changes at a global level? We've got to keep fighting because it's, you know, it's still important. We've made changes, yes, lots mm. of progress has been made, but there's still an awful lot to do. And I think that's what you're saying, mm. saying there, Joe, is really important in terms of, um, you know, with a small amount of money, what it can be done. It's not all about money, but the money is important. You know, women's organizations need to have funding to do a certain amount of work. You want to bring people together, you've got to pay for the transport. So it's not, um, you know, that women are just going to do things without funding. I think there is support is needed, but there's also got to be the political will. And if you get women out on the streets making demands, I think politicians have to listen. But also, um, you know, if you have women in positions of power, the right sort of women in the positions of power that are open to engage, that's, that's really important. So I think um, what both of you saying was about different spaces, I think it's, it's really important to ensure that women's voices are being heard. And, um, but also engaging with men, I think. You know, the pictures that you showed there of men sort of listening and also you know, men bec being aware that it's about gender relations um, is quite important as well. Um, and, um, you know, that men, you know, have a part to play in women's empowerment. And um, so I think, you know, trying to get the message out um, and that's, um, you know, using the media as well, you know, trying to raise awareness more broadly is really important. So raising her voices is, you know, it's not just women raising their voices um, in the, where they are, but getting it out to a wider public and trying to change attitudes as well is quite important to engage on a bigger picture. Um, and I thought it was really important what Joe was saying about the, you know, different types of actions, legal reform, human rights, getting budgets there, and also addressing issues in relation to governance, <coughs> you know, things that marginalize people, you know, um, you know, are, find it difficult to raise, you know, sort of pushing those issues up the agenda. Um, so, for example, HIV, domestic violence, gay rights. So those are all topics that are very controversial, and especially somewhere like Uganda, <laughs> you know, so getting those mm -hmm. things on the agenda, getting the laws in place are important frameworks to have. So, um, so yes, I thought it was really very impressive. And I mean, Oxfam, obviously, you've got the power <laughs> as well as an organisation, mm -hmm. you know. So you, you know, you are able to achieve a lot. Um, so I think you know that's really good. Hopefully, that your programme is going to continue, and um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and because that's the thing, you know, we are also victims to sort of flavour of the month and what you know where we get our funding from is going to, you know, have an important impact on the sorts of programs that we want to run. So um, hopefully your pathways and raising your voices are going to okay. be able to continue. <laughs> um, but I just, I did want to say something about um, some of the work that Corn has been doing in Honduras, um, because, um, you know, they're working in, the, operating in a climate of violence um, and on women's advocacy is very difficult, but it's not impossible. And um, in, in Honduras, um, there is a context of extreme violence. It's um, one of the most violent countries in, in, in the Western Hemisphere, and violence against women is widespread. Femicides, the sort of brutal killing of women, 
is very high, domestic violence is very high, and it's carried out by street gangs, by members of the state security forces, and um, in women's homes. And since the coup in 2009, violence has intensified, and women human rights activists, journalists, and students have been specifically targeted and receiving death threats and being um, brutally murdered as well. And um, violence isn't new in Honduras. Um, Central America Women's Network has worked with a partner for the last five years, the Centro de Estudios de la Mujer, CEMACHE, on the program to address violence against women and poverty and taking a multi-pronged approach. And there have been several successful strategies, and some of these have been mentioned, so I'd just like to reiterate that we've seen those strategies working on the ground. Um, <clears throat> this program has been working at a community level to, on violence against women. And it's um, had a focus on empowering poor women, um, to women living in poverty, to address violence in their communities. <clears throat> and in the recent evaluation of the project, the evaluator was very impressed by the capacity of so many women who had participated in the project to speak up um, by their high levels of self-esteem and their confidence and the way that they addressed a broad range of issues, just as we saw that woman in Nepal. You know, I mean, some training, bringing women together, giving them that self-confidence, they, they would just run and go with it. And in this project, then, we set up self-help groups um, in um, rural areas with indigenous community women, with um, Garifuna, Afro, um, um, Honduran women, and in marginal communities outside the capital of Tegucigalpa. And these self-help groups um, <coughs> provided mutual support and empowered women survivors of violence to seek justice and to find solutions and to put an end to violence. And these self-help groups um, don't actually need a lot of money. Women just come together and help each other in their own homes and in their own communities. Um, we also helped to train legal promoters. And these were also women in the communities, but they were given legal knowledge in order to um, access justice. And um, these were supported by um, the Semachi to deal with police, judges, justice of the peace, um, and um, domestic violence cases. And um, in terms of advocacy, um, a successful strategy was to build the capacity um, of service delivery um, by the training police, judiciary, um, um, judges, public prosecutors, and um, we had several successful workshops, and also working with men in the community. Um, so doing workshops on non-violent masculinities, for example. Marilyn, I'm going to have to okay. So we'll let me type just on time, okay? So just okay. wind up, please. So I'd just like to say that since the coup, um, the situation has changed, and um, laws that were reformed um, um, are having a backlash on women's rights. And um, women are finding it much more difficult to work on advocacy because they don't trust the people that they were working with before. So, um, you know, it's a case of one step forward and one step back. You know, you can do all this activism and get women empowered, and yet um, you, you have a coup and the political context changes and women's rights take a, a step backwards. But one very encouraging thing was a lot of the men in the social movements um, were actually quite empowered by women's activism during the coup. They, women set up the feminist and resistance movement, and men saw their capacity to organize and get out in the streets. And now they're joining in the women's marches on violence against women. So, um, uh, so you know, there's different aspects, you know, but the social movement um, in Honduras is still very active okay. it, with, in spite of the repression. <laughs> Thanks very much, Marlene. Okay. Thanks for our speakers. Now, we were yeah. supposed to go on until 2 o'clock, so I'm, and we're taking people's working hours. So uh, if people need to leave now, then that's absolutely fine. If people want to stay uh, for five, ten minutes of questions or discussion, that's fine too. 
um, but uh, there's no shame if you need to go. So uh, this is the break point for you to sneak out if you need to sneak out. You have 30 seconds to leave the room. And then we can, uh, <laughs> um, two of the things that struck me about those three presentations, I'll just sort of ad lib until people finish leaving. Um, one is the, the emphasis on the law in, in Joe's examples and whether the law is that essential either a battleground or a way of ensuring sustainability and longevity to any gains, mm -hmm. and just to what extent is that central to what we're doing. I didn't hear the law in Jethro's uh, discussion, at least not, not explicitly, mm -hmm. so that was kind of interesting. <coughs> um, I think there were some other um, issues which arose, um, but I think I'm going to leave it there because people have left. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so okay, so you don't have to ask questions, you can make comments, that's mm -hmm. fine too, uh, but we're going to go for 10 minutes mm -hmm. and then we're going to stop. So. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that. Uh, my name is Zora. I'm from Action Aid. Uh, and I had a comment and then a question. The comment was I thought it was interesting the way you talked about uh, violence, gender based violence against women and girls as influencing participation and why that can seem as a tangential aspect of governance. And I would comment that actually the levels of gender based violence against women and girls is itself a governance failure that needs to be addressed. So it's not just influencing women's access to formal yeah. politics mm -hmm. is actually a failure of the state sure. to attack and respond. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, in terms of a question, Jethro, for you, mm -hmm. um, you talked about the training women might need to be able to navigate a particular space, a particular space of power, um, and there's a lot of focus, I find, on, on that supply side. So what do women need to be able to enter or be useful once they get there or have influence? Did you have any thoughts on the demand side? So how do those spaces need to be transformed? And what does it cost women to participate um, buying into the terms as they're framed now? So they get trained up how to navigate that space and reinforce the nature of that space and accept its, its governing laws and rules. OK, hold that. We'll, come, we'll take a mm -hmm. few, if that's OK. Uh, yeah, speak with that. Um, I have one question uh, uh, to Joe about um, uh, you've obviously done a, a wide range of different, um, uh, taken a wide of different approaches which are very context specific. Um, there was less focus on economic empowerment and I was wondering, I'm, obviously this is uh, something you will have thought about a lot and I'm wondering how, how that relates just to some comments and that would be really useful. Okay. Um, I guess one thing that really strikes me when I think about women's participation and um, what was really obviously came up quite strongly in the video that we watched is that it seems that often it's the case that women, when they do are empowered to participate um, in public po life and in public, public politics, it's very much a question of you can do this, but only once you've done the washing, once you've done the washing up, once you've fed your children and you've put them to bed and you've done everything that you need to do in the domestic sphere, then you can go out and participate in the public sphere. And that's, a, I mean, that's an ongoing struggle anyway, I think, in terms of um, how we change some of those more entrenched uh, gender roles. And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about that in, um, in terms of, obviously, Joe, you mentioned um, how the care economy is becoming increasingly prominent on the, on the development agenda. Um, and so how that really feeds in and, and what your thoughts are on changing some of those more intractable um, social norms. I think we're only going to have time for one round, so I'll keep the round going until everyone's <laughs> had their bit. Uh, anyone else want to say something? Um, yeah, and then. Uh, I actually found the, what you said about the Gambia was very interesting. And I was wondering how, uh, especially the uh, African Women's Protocol, um, how you, because I, I mean, I know that governments are quite reluctant to enforce those, uh, the Afri even even the African uh, system, um, the African human rights instruments in general. So I was wondering, I mean, the connecting to what she said. So basically, the social sphere is is um, is a is a huge constraint on women, but also the government. Uh, how how you've dealt with with that with to yeah basically get them to approve. And, and recognize the, the protocol as part of the domestic law. Okay. Yeah, um, let's jump on more. Yeah, I, I, I want to kind of come from the Honduras experience, uh, from the discussant. I think one key point there that was coming through, because you were rushed a bit, was <laughs> how, how when dynamics change, what happens to the kind of spaces and what, what happens to 
to that engagement or that investment in women empowerment what when then suddenly something happens uh, government changes or something another regime comes or something just happens from nowhere which you didn't even anticipate uh, and it, it seems you were trying to say something about how then men came on board or something yeah. what what happened in the pro well, that deliberate built into the project that something could happen and therefore this would be what would, would happen i think it reflects again on what we do yeah. when things are all everything is nice is one thing but yeah. when then something happens what happens to all these yeah. forms of engagement that we're talking about my word, we have another kind of resilience. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Resilience is everything. Now, resilience in accountability and politics. Great. Okay. Um, any other, or can we go to, okay, concluding remarks. Um, 30 seconds, Marilyn. Two minutes. Okay. <laughs> Two minutes. Jethro, is that okay? Okay, sure. yes. I'll just um, respond to your, to your question there. Um, I think the answer is that if you've built up that strength in the community mm -hmm. and that belief, the women's belief, then, mm -hmm. they're, then they're going to carry on struggling. They were out on the streets, feminists and resistance, opposing lack of democracy because of the coup. Yeah, okay. And yet, you know, some of those women have received death threats, some have had to leave the country. Mm -hmm. But their political conviction is very strong. And although there have been lots of step backwards because of changes of laws and mm -hmm. the backlash against women's organization, they are still strong because you know, a lot of time was invested in building up their self-esteem and their confidence, but it means a big struggle to get back to where they were before the coup. Yeah. But I think that's a really important thing. You can't just take for granted that the democratic yeah. structures are always going to be there. Yes, okay. so. Thanks, Which is why the personal level is so important. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and I won't make comment, uh, Duncan's comment again, which is what I would have said, mm. resilience. You know, mm. We can't just think about the things that people are mostly thinking about, about resilience in relation to some of the things like climate change, we have to also think about mm -hmm. political resilience mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. internal resilience in, yeah. in, mm -hmm. in, in terms of people's self-belief as well, I think. So, okay, two minutes. Um, I'll you had economic it. empowerment economic and the empowerment, absolutely. in two minutes. So, economic <laughs> empowerment, absolutely crucial. Uh, we didn't deliberately <coughs> choose to focus on that piece, partly because we kind of feel that that's the piece people tend to gravitate towards. There's much more focus in the development industry on the livelihoods end of the spectrum and economic. I mean, and in Oxford, o Oxfam, we have a whole women's economic leadership program. You know, so we were deliberately not doing that piece. But I think they're totally intertwined with each other. You can't separate them out. Um, but you know, economics tends to be the centre of gravity. So we were sort of trying to. Uh, rebalance somewhat I think and then the whole um, I just a little bit on the care economy piece so I think um, and I did mention it at the beginning I think we're uh, women doing this on top of all the caring responsibility I think there's a growing real I mean feminists have been saying for quite some time care economy care economy um, but I think we're getting to a point now where actually the whole area of the care economy as with the environmental sector is beginning to come into the frame in terms of what is sustainable on a planetary level and I'm quite excited about how do we actually bring those things that look disconnected into one place. I think we're there on the perhaps sustainable economics debate it's beginning to move and the environmental bringing that together with the economics is beginning to move but I think bringing the care economy into that economics and thinking about environment that that's what we've got to do we've got to reframe um, as part of our ongoing thinking. So that's, that's the piece, one piece. And then on the Africa Women's Protocol, I think, um, yeah, I mean, it's a bit context specific. In, uh, some of the governments are far keener to kind of go with it. But I think the critical thing about the, the protocol is that it's homegrown. It was created by Africans. Um, it's not a Western imposition. So it's been a really important lever to kind of convincing governments in Africa that, that change is needed. The, the, the domestication issue, I think, you know, you succeed with that when there's pressure coming up from underneath, which is why in our programs we put so much focus on getting the networks and alliances and coalitions uh, strengthened, because it, when the pressure comes from below, governments are going to um, be more inclined to listen than when it's coming from the outside. And I think we could talk at another time about how you combine different strategies to, to make that happen. But um, I think that's been a really important piece. And I'll shut up. Just a quick um, just yes, observation please. about the Gambia, sorry. 
um, Emily mm. is our project mm. coordinator for the for the whole raising her voice, mm. so she knows far more than I do. Um, I had a really interesting conversation with the, the uh, human rights organisation that coordinate this project in Gambia, and he said, firstly, there's four million people, um, and mostly family members. Our power and houses shows us exactly where we need to go to help. So you know, we, we're looking at the where the power lies and our connections as well to help put the pressures on and, and um, get a kind of local local um, strike force to, to, to keep so high on the agenda. Um, also, uh, collaboration with UN Women um, at the regional level, looking at the multi-sexual approach to implementing the Mobutu uh, Protocol in the piloting six countries who've stood up and said yes, you know, in terms of our, um, you know, um, sh showing good goodwill and, and good brownie points with, against with their peers. And um, Gambia is one of the government, one of the governments um, going forward on that pilot as well in terms of how do we integrate this piece of legislation across all line ministries. Uh, resource that as well, so a nice range of range of approaches to, to try and make make that real. Thanks, Evan. Yeah. yeah. So just a maybe a brief comment about the sort of. Uh, context and closing of spaces issue, which I think is really important, and I don't want to end on a negative note, but I think, you know, in addition to what, what has been said about the, uh, the shift in political context and how that can suddenly erode and create backlash, uh, I mean, there are many other forces as well. We talked about the economic sphere and deepening inequality uh, has a direct impact um, on women, usually more pronounced. and. Um, also affects uh, their ability to engage in civil and political rights if they're just struggling for economic survival, um, and uh, and if they're they're confined to the domestic sphere for that survival. So I think the economic sphere, and then linked to that, is the increasing um, sort of epidemic of natural resource right uh, rights violations, and land grabbing, and removal of people's livelihoods, which is happening, you know, at a pace that we just can't even fathom. And it's affecting women and men, but um, I think that's something that's you know having a huge effect on on women's livelihoods and rights and on their movements. And then um, there's also the kind of link to that the the growing role of non-state um, organized crime, whether it's uh, the people at the front lines of the land grabbing who are working for um, corporate corporate interests often, or you know drug and narco forces and organized crime and so on. So that. And a lot of the violence that uh, has been discussed that's perpetrated against women in Central America is actually coming also from that organized crime side of things and not, not just from the kind of the state in the formal sense. And then finally, just conservative political and religious forces, which are also having a real backlash effect. I mean, those are all quite sort of negative things, but I think they're very real. We have to be very aware of them. And I think in, in a lot of the sort of frontline workshops that we've had around this power analysis stuff, like the ones that you described, Marilyn. Um, this is what people are talking about. This is the reality. These are the really stark realities. And people are talking about survival. And they're talking about holding on to what they've got or preventing losing more than they might lose otherwise. Th that's the kind of language you're hearing, is how can, we, how can we prevent losing more? How can we lose only a little? And so there's a lot of, um, um, and yet I think there are also really positive examples of, of gains, and we have to kind of um, um, work work on both of those fronts. Um, just to answer your question, is it Zora? Mm -hmm. Yeah, about the the um, supply side versus, demand, supply side side. versus <laughs> demand side. I think it's a really good question. I mean, I'm probably not the right person to ask because I'm not somebody who has a huge amount of faith in top-down institutional change and organizational change. I mean, I do think you need to recognize what the rules are and try to change them and sort of call for different kinds of conduct and behavior and protocols and so on in, in institutional spaces. But I think ultimately institutions are cultural and they respond to cultural um, demand and um, the sort of make we make the path by walking kind of approach. And that's why I think that uh, actions that involve um, creating spaces, claiming spaces, and transforming existing spaces through uh, sort of subaltern activities and behaving differently within them, which involves kind of recognizing what those boundaries and rules are, and then changing them by acting differently, even if it's in really minute um, sort of countercultural ways that shift the environment, that that's, that's probably where you're going to get the most change. And it may be, as Joe said, slow and incremental and imperceptible. But ultimately, I think that's where the change is going to happen.
Okay, so we're back to occupying RDS. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much. I'm glad we got Great. faith in there as we're in Christian Aid. I'm also glad that it didn't take over the entire meeting, but it would have been interesting. Um, thank you to Christian Aid. Thank you to Dipper for all its money. Um, thank you to you for giving up your lunch hours, and thank you to the speakers. Can I have a round of applause? I thought they were great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. We've got a little bit of Raising Her Voice related literature here on the table. Um, if they run out and you are interested, then, then if you could give Emily your details, we can let you have it. Oh, the Ning site. What happened to the last slide? We have a website oh, for Raising Her Voice. Yeah. Was it there? Yeah, it was okay. there, yeah. So just to encourage you to go there, there's stacks and stacks of stuff on that site, mm -hmm. videos, photos, stories, the change model, the evaluation reports. Uh, have a dig. Great. Yeah, I'm going to look. It looks really good. It looks fantastic.